Greetings in our Lord's name. I'm Michael Bourne. We're going to turn in this sermon to one of the great Psalms, Psalm 19, if you take your Bible and turn to it. The Christian writer C.S. Lewis says it is the greatest poem in the Psalms and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. Well, <laughs> that's some praise, isn't it? This wonderful Psalms, it's worth our looking at it. David uh, revels in God revealing himself in creation, in his word, and in personal relationship. For David, the wonder of creation would, of course, have surrounded him day by day, uh, not least when he was a shepherd boy, later on the run in the wilderness. And so his soul bursts out in verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day by day he would have exulted in creation around him. For those of us who live in areas where God's beauty is visible, we can echo this. I'm very grateful that where I now live, in my retirement, I have a, a big view of the sky, and I'm drawn to that window every morning to praise and adore our amazing Creator God. But when working in the inner city, the wonders of creation were hardly impacting us. Taking boys away to camp uh, into the open countryside by the sea uh, from the inner city, uh, they were frightened. They were frightened by the size of the sky. They had no concept of the beauty of creation. It was all overwhelming to them. Security was a, a chimney or something like that. So um, this psalm is a challenge, particularly to those living in cities, to look up, to get out of the city for a day or for holidays, and to drink in the wonder of God's creation. David was marvellous at uh, seeing things in the creation and applying them in his own life. He sees the shadow a gap, the shadowy gap in the rocks, and sees that as the valley of the shadow of death. The waters coming through are the still waters that we're led by. He observes the small animals called hinds, who move with utter security along the narrowest of ledges uh, with their little feet. And he speaks of the way God gives us the same security as we follow him. He saw, he learnt, he applied. A few years ago, a mature and gifted Christian lady asked me to write a hymn for her funeral. I was quite surprised. Uh, she said there was no hymn that expressed her overwhelming love of creation. I asked her to send me a list of what she'd like in it. Well, the list was three large pages long. It opened my mind and heart to the huge range of God's creation. Uh, it was from planets and stars to trees and flowers and fruit and animals of every kind to human beings. It's been a joy actually to write the hymn and to praise God with it as we sing of deserts and forests and lakes and birds and flowers and vegetables, frogs and butterflies, birds, ants, apes, yaks, horses, polar bears and humankind and all sorts of things and all cause for praise to our Creator God. Yep, David would approve. In heaven we shall not only glory in redemption, but we shall first glory in God as Creator. When the living creatures say in Revelation 4.8, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, it is a prelude to worshipping with, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. In a world where so many will not allow God into their thinking, we need to declare more fully the glory of God in creation. Recently, a famous scientist in Britain, right at the top of his trade, uh, said that the likelihood of a universe giving us life, coming into existence by coincidence, is one in billions of billions, even one in trillions of trillions. Yet he still refuses to believe in God and creation because he's ruled God out of his thinking. He's got a closed mind. How transformed is our vision when we see everything in the world as part of God's wonderful creation. We see scientists thinking his thoughts after him, as we see particularly the wonders of the human body and the quite incredible human brain. We can only stand back with our God and rejoice and proclaim and praise. It was a global witness that the chief coordinator of the development of genes, DNA, Francis Collins, a fine Christian, helped President Clinton to use the words, the language of God, about DNA in his global speech about it. Indeed, it was very appropriate. 
A medical student I met recently was so stunned by the amazing complexity and beauty of DNA that she turned to God and found Christ. Yes, creation speaks without words. David's poetic heart expresses this so well. Day after day they pour forth speech, he says. And verse 3, there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. In verse 2, he adds, night after night they display knowledge. It is said, and you may have heard this story, that during the Russian Revolution of many years ago, the agents of the regime came to destroy every semblance of the faith. We will destroy your churches and steeples, they said as they went into the villages, so that nothing is left to remind you of your old superstition. The peasant farmers replied, but you can't stop leaving us the stars. The heavens do indeed declare the glory of God. Every part of the whole world is able to see this. So verse 5 says, Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. It's this truth that Paul picks up uh, in his exposure of human sin, of course, in Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. That's powerful. There's sheer poetry in the description now back in the psalm of the bridegroom coming out of his pavilion and effectively circuiting the earth. But the point is again that he goes everywhere and the phrase nothing is hid from the heat is not so much about heat. It's actually about the universal influence of the creation, the universal rule and authority of the creator revealing himself to the whole world. But David knows how vital it is that we hear God's revelation of himself through his word. So the second revelation in the psalm is spelt out from verse 7. It was sad to hear a leading politician in Britain say that of course he believed in God, but he went walking in the countryside on Sundays and worshipped that way. He didn't need to go to church. No wonder his life is untouched by God's amazing word. How differently he would act if it was. For David, a large part of the word in those Old Testament days was about the law. And the law is, do that, don't do that. Again, the great Christian thinker C.S. Lewis wrestled with the description of the law in verse 10. If you look at it here, look down at verse 10, you'll see, as sweeter than honey. See, how can it be? How is it that something has to be obeyed and feared, something that reproves us and stops us and corrects us? How can it be sweeter than honey? But then he saw that it meant that when we walk according to God's word, then life is on track. It runs smoothly, even in the midst of problems. It's like a car engine being perfectly tuned, or a piano being brought to its intended pitch. It's like coordinated colours. When a road sign says no right turn, it's not being restrictive, it is avoiding chaos and crashes. When God says do not, it is for our good. When God says do this, it is for our good. If we have a machine of some sort and ignore the maker's instructions, there will be breakdown ahead. We know that. And so if we follow the maker's instructions, as far as life is concerned, life should work beautifully. So the Bible is for us the maker's perfect instructions. And when followed, allows our life to work in beautiful harmony with him. Beautifully, even though circumstances are tough, his word is to us sweeter than honey. When seen like this, then the other verses of 7 to 11 ring true. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. That's true, isn't it? It's amazing that the Bible is alive every day. This should be our daily experience. And, uh, and if we don't have that daily experience, our soul shrivels. It's as simple as that. The statutes, he said, are trustworthy, and if we trust them, then the simplest person, not just the intelligent person, the simplest person, can know life abundant in Christ. The statutes are right, give joy, radiate light, they are sure, they are righteous. In this materialistic age in which we live, we need to hear verse 10. God's word is more precious than gold, than much pure gold. The values of the world are upside down. In fact, the materialistic values are going crazy with greed. To every believer should check we're not being seduced by them. So let us ask ourselves, is his word really more precious than gold to you, to me, sweeter than honey? If not, then put on the brakes, take an honest assessment of your values, get back to living 
with and under the precious word of God. Verse 11 sums up the issue. If we do not keep the word, we are warned. If we do, there is great reward. Amen to that. But now from verse 11 to the end, we come to the ultimate revelation to us personally. We now have you, me, I. It's possible to rejoice in the revelation of creation and the word, but not to get to a personal relationship with God, not to know the spirit, witnessing with our spirit that we are children of God, as Romans 8 puts it, not to know the inward touch of the spirit that illuminates, encourages, corrects, inspires, and strengthens us. David does have this relationship, even in this pre-Christ era. He engages first on his need to be right with God here, and includes hidden faults as being in need of forgiveness. He also seeks help to be prevented from acting willfully against God. In the old confession of the church I belonged to, there was a similar balance. We were taught to ask forgiveness for not doing what we ought to have done, as well as forgiveness for doing what we ought not to have done. Very often we only think of the, of the latter part. It's a lasting framework for a prayer of forgiveness. And then the positives the desire to please God in speaking and meditating so that his life is constantly reorientated day after day after day to God's will. I spoke on this need of personal relationship with God in a sermon a few weeks ago. I just received a letter from an 85-year-old lady who was there saying how she now sees her relationship with our Lord to be important. She's now seeking it, she says, with a willing heart. Well, we're never too old to enter into knowing our Lord in this wonderful way. Having become a widower a few months ago, I've actually been overwhelmed by the far greater intensity of this relationship as I live alone. The wonderful encouragements that are more than I've ever known before. Frequent contact in praise and prayer and reveling in his love. I thank God every day that he's given me fresh visions, fresh visions of heaven, fresh touches of his love, and I really am thrilled and overwhelmed by it. God now means everything to David. It is not God out there in creation, although it is, because he worships him as creator, or God in his word, but most of all, it is his adoring heart, speaking of his Lord in verse 14, as my rock, and my Redeemer, that's revelation at the heart. Is he your rock? Is he your Redeemer? God bless you.